reading is from John 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they, had, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Hebrew Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not, hold, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that what he had said and that he had said these things to her. Good morning again. So last Sunday we talked about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples riding in on a donkey. And we talked about how uh, the feeling on that morning might be something like the feeling at the beginning of a basketball game. Where you have the team running out onto the floor to the cheers of crowds and, and the band playing. It would be almost an electric kind of entrance onto the scene. That would have been the feeling that they would have had as they rode into Jerusalem last week, one week ago. That's how this week started for Jesus and his disciples, but that's, well, that's not how it ended. That is not today. Today is Easter Sunday, and, and there's a particular hope and joy on Easter Sunday. But it's important to note that there's a different feeling today in the story of Jesus. If Palm Sunday was this high energy run onto the court before the big game kind of feeling, well now, now we're into double and triple overtime. Now we have gone through a long, hard week full of all kinds of conflicts and violence. At this point in the story, the Jesus, Jesus and the disciples are worn out. They've been beaten up and bruised. And up until Easter morning, it looks like they actually had lost the game. Yes, there is a victory to be celebrated on Easter morning, but it's not a naive celebration. Instead, today, it's a celebration that the love of God ultimately wins. But it's also a celebration that still has the reality of pain and suffering fresh in its memory. In our scripture for today, there's a certain joy and hope, but there's also a significant amount of confusion and pain. See, on one hand, you could say that the disciples knew what they were getting into when they were riding into Jerusalem. But actually, I think there's a bigger case to be made that they really didn't have a clue what was going on. They didn't really know what Jesus was up to until well after the resurrection. 
When the disciples rode, rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, they likely thought that they were riding in to start an actual rebellion of some sort. They were looking to Jesus as the Messiah in a conventional sense, which meant they were looking to Jesus to lead a political or religious revolution, to free the Jewish people, and to throw Rome off of their backs. But the thing is, that when we look at the story, we know that that's not exactly what Jesus had planned. Jesus knew that he was headed for his own death. And when it becomes crystal clear that he was headed for his own death and that he was not going to win in the way that they expected, the disciples all abandon him. They all scatter. In fact, Peter even denies that he even knows who Jesus is. Not once, but three different times. It's important to understand that the disciples didn't really get the whole resurrection thing at first because that helps us understand what kind of mindset they were in on that Sunday morning. See, in their mind, the story was over. They had spent the last three years following this radical rabbi all over the place. Most of them thought that they were going to lead this political rebellion and establish some sort of new physical kingdom there in Jerusalem. They had begun the week on this incredible high of excitement, but by the end of the week, everything had come crashing down. By the end of the week, the disciples were scattered. Their leader, who they thought was the Messiah, he had been arrested. He had been tried before both the Jewish leaders and the Roman authorities. And then he had been publicly beaten and humiliated, and finally stripped of his clothes and nailed to a cross, and left for dead. Only after Jesus died and was put into a tomb did the disciples begin to come back together very slowly at first. And they did so in secret and behind heavy locked doors because, well, now they knew that they were wanted too. If, Jesus, or if Rome killed their leader, surely they were marked men as well. If the beginning of the week was all about high excitement and a feeling of game on, the beginning of our scripture for today, the feeling is game over. They lost. Jesus was killed, and death is about as final as it gets. So I think it's important to understand the depth of pain and sorrow and confusion and anxiety of that moment, because that helps us to understand what comes in our scripture for today. Imagine walking along with Mary, first thing on Sunday morning. You're going out before anybody's awake, which is probably irrelevant because you haven't slept in the last two days anyways. But there you are, walking with Mary as she goes out to the tomb where they put Jesus after he was crucified. On Friday, things were in a rush because they had to take down all the dead bodies and put them in tombs before the Sabbath began on Friday night at sunset. So they had hurriedly put Jesus in this tomb. And now, after the Sabbath, Mary is coming to do the proper burial rituals. She's coming to pay her last respects to Jesus. And so she makes her way out to the cemetery. But when she gets there, she finds that the big stone that's used to cover the tomb had been rolled away and that, that his body wasn't there. Now at this point in the story, I think she has the same reaction that any of us would have had if we were in her shoes. She automatically assumes that someone has stolen Jesus' body. Not only has Jesus been killed, but now somebody has added insult to injury and has stolen his body and is going to do who knows what with it. And so, distraught, she runs back to where the other disciples were and she tells Peter and John that the tomb is empty. And so they run out, and sure enough, they find the tomb empty as well. Eventually, Peter and the other disciple head back home while Mary stays out in the garden weeping. And as she's crying, Jesus comes up to her and asks her what's wrong. She still doesn't quite understand what has happened, and so she thinks that he is the gardener or the caretaker. And through her tears, she begs him, saying, Somebody took my Lord. If you know where he is, please bring him back. 
And it's at this point that Jesus looks at Mary in the eyes and says, Mary. At which point she recognizes that it's Jesus and says, Teacher! She reaches out to grab him and he says, No, don't hang on to me yet. Go back and tell the others what you've seen. And so she goes, saying, I have seen my Lord. And that's where our scripture ends. Now here's the thing about that moment in the story. At this moment in the story, the disciples still really don't know what lays ahead for them. All they really know is that somehow the story is not over. Set aside for a moment that you all know the rest of the story. Forget for just a little bit that you know that Jesus eventually comes back and, and teaches the disciples for 40 more days before He ascends up into heaven. Forget that you know there's a thing called the early church and that that continues on for 2,000 years leading to us sitting here today. Forget all of that for a second. And just be in that moment with Mary and the disciples. At that moment, the only thing that the disciples really know is that the story isn't over. All they know is that they thought that their movement was completely destroyed, that their leader had been defeated, and that they were completely done for. But now they have found out that somehow, some, some way, the, no, the story is not over. Jesus is not actually dead. They don't really know what that means or how it happened or, or, how, or what's going to happen in the future. All they know is, what they th is that what they thought was the end of themselves and the end of their story is somehow not the end of the story. Which means that yes, there is a joy and a hope at this point in the story, but it is a very different kind of hope and joy than we saw last week. Last week we saw a hope and a joy that comes from open possibilities. Last week the disciples were riding into Jerusalem and the world was their oyster. Anything could happen. This week, however, we find a hope and a joy that has come face to face with all of the evil and the pain and suffering that the world has to offer. This, this week we find a hope that clearly sees the reality of pain and death, and yet it is a hope that knows that even death is not the end. As I've searched for the words this week to try and describe the difference in feeling between the two stories, this week and last week, the word that keeps coming back to me is that, that we are left with a hope today that is somehow more mature than the hope of last week. Last week was a hope and excitement that really didn't know quite what we were getting into. And yes, there are times where that kind of hope and excitement is important and we need it. But this week is different. This week we have a hope that doesn't pretend that this, the future is going to be all sunshine and roses. But rather this week we have a hope that is still walking around with fresh wounds that have been given out by the evils of this world. It's a hope that understands the depth of pain in this world, but it also understands that no matter how big or deep that pain is, that at the end of the day, the love of God is bigger and deeper than all of it. The hope that we celebrate this morning comes from the simple fact that even when, it, when we come to what looks like the end, even then, the story is not over. That's the hope of the resurrection. That's what we celebrate today. See, sometimes there's, there's a little bit of difficulty in how we celebrate Holy Week in the modern church. A lot of times we wind up really only focusing on the two Sundays, on Palm Sunday and Easter. And sometimes it's really easy just to go from one directly to the other and to think that Easter is just a continuation of the celebration of Palm Sunday. That, that Palm Sunday leads directly to Easter. The problem is that the hope of Easter is not that Palm Sunday leads to Easter. But rather, the good news of Easter morning is that Palm Sunday ultimately leads to Good Friday. Palm Sunday leads to a place where we thought the story 
was over and done with. But then on Easter morning, we find out that no, the story is not, in fact, over. The story keeps on going. Jesus comes back to life, but at the same time, he's now carrying the scars of the whips. He's carrying the, the black and blue bruises from the beating. He still has holes in his hands and his feet and his side. The good news of Easter is not that it is the same Jesus that shows up on Easter that showed up in the triumphal entry. But rather, the good news of Easter is that we now see the same Jesus alive again who we saw on Good Friday, hanging on a cross. The good news of Easter is not that everything will be easy in our lives. The good news of Easter is that even when we think our life is over, even then the love of God continues on. The good news of Easter is that yes, we're going to continue to walk around a little bit beat up and broken at times, but we will continue on, even if we thought we shouldn't. There's a cycle of dying and rising, of death and resurrection that seems to be built into the universe that Jesus shows us in this Scripture, but shows us in many other places as well. And the thing is, a lot of times we love to see the new life that comes. We celebrate resurrection or new birth. But the truth is that we also have to remember that new birth always comes at a cost. Resurrection requires the death or the letting go of something old. Resurrection requires us to give up a piece of who we are. It's something that Jesus made very clear when he was talking about his own death and resurrection as well as what it means to follow him in this life. In the Gospel of John chapter 23, or, sorry, in the Gospel of John chapter 12, verse 23, he says this. Jesus answered them, "The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain." But if it does fall into the ground and die, then it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. There's a cycle of letting go of our life in order to find new life in Christ. It's something that seems to be built into our core being. It's built into a core practice of our faith as well. The Apostle Paul talks about this dying and rising through the practice of baptism when he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in the newness of life. A while back, I came across a phrase that really connects with me for this idea of death and resurrection. And I don't remember exactly what context it's in, but it still holds a strong image for me. The phrase is, and he came to the end of himself. He came to the end of himself. And I like that phrase for a couple of reasons. For starters, it's a phrase that has this idea of hitting rock bottom, but it's more than that. It implies that someone has hit the end of all that they are. They have used up their abilities and their resources. They have come to the very end of their being. It's a phrase that communicates that if I'm going to continue on living, then it has to be somebody else, something else that is living inside of me. Because I have used up all of the me that I have. And my guess is that some of you hearing this this morning will probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Because some of you have hit that point in your life at different times. Some of you have come to the end of yourself and have found that hope of resurrection knowing that if you're going to keep on going, it has to be Christ that's living inside of you. Some people know exactly what I'm talking about and some of us may not. But that's okay. This is a message that we all need to hang on to, even if it's not for ourselves, maybe for somebody that we know. There's a very good chance that someone hearing this message this morning really needs to hear this message of hope. 
There's a good chance that right now someone has come awfully close to the end of themselves and right now you need to hear the good news that your story is not over. This morning, there may be somebody here or who's listening to this recording that really needs to know that even though you may have come to the point where you think that everything is done, that you can't go on, in reality, your story is not over. And like I said, some of us may not feel like we need to hear that message for ourselves this morning, but I bet you know somebody who does. Somebody who you need to tell your story is not over over. We all need to hear that the the power that brought Jesus back from the dead is still at work. It's still at work in each one of us. Our stories are not over. Can I borrow Over the last six weeks, we've been working on a project as the church. After each of the sermons, we have taken the time to weave in different pieces of cloth. And this represents a whole bunch of different things for us. Each of these pieces of cloth represents that that our stories are woven in with each other. It represents that that our stories are not alone, that they are woven into God's larger unfolding story. It represents that, that even if our story does come to an end, that God's story will continue on. There's some work that needs to be done on this piece of art to finish it up and to sew it all together. But it's worth noting this morning that that this piece is intended to be a little bit unfinished. It's intended to be a little rough around the edges. The tails have yet to be woven together. And that is to symbolize the hope of Easter. It's to remind us that our stories are not over. That the story of God continues on and we are a part of that. This morning we are reminded to hang on to the hope of Easter each and every day. Which is that even when it looks like death has won, that no, in fact Jesus is not on the cross anymore and the tomb is empty. Your story is not finished. Amen.